Good morning, everyone. Welcome to IBO's webinar on education indicators, focusing on uh, the attendance and achievement sections that we recently updated. Uh, my name is Sarita Subramanian. I'm Assistant Director for Education at IBO, and I'll be moderating today. I'm joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Taina Guarda, uh, Budget and Policy Analyst, and Steph Cranes, Senior Budget and Policy Analyst. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping reminders for the webinar. Um, so everyone knows this webinar is being recorded. Uh, upon the completion of the webinar, we will post the recording on our website um, and we'll make that available to everyone to access. Um, I'd also like to call your attention to the bottom of your screen to the Q&A button. Um, please uh, feel free to submit questions using the Q&A function. Um, we will allow for Q&A throughout the webinar during certain portions, uh, so please submit your questions as they come to you, and I will ask the panelists uh, during those breaks. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to just review, uh, give you a background about what education indicators are uh, and the history of education indicators at IBO. So the indicators is a volume of data intended to serve as a reference document, and we provide snapshots of the public school system, ranging from the students served and their demographics, metrics of attendance and achievement um, at various levels, um, and the schools and programs in the system and resources available. And that includes teacher and principal demographics, budget data, and course offerings. IBO first published education indicators in 2011, and it's been updated and revamped several times, um, oftentimes in uh, sections at a time. And so uh, it, certain sections may provide um, years of data that vary um, across the different sections. Uh, the pandemic has disrupted our standard data collection across various data sets uh, a bit, and we are currently uh, working through that and um, getting access to that data from the Department of Education. But this release provides a baseline pre-pandemic snapshot for attendance and achievement. Uh, so the attendance section is before the schools shut down in 2019-20. And if you recall, um, the achievement is based on the New York State standardized tests and re regions exams that were not administered that spring of 2020. So actually refer to the 1819 school year. Um, I'll just go over a brief agenda for this morning. Uh, Taina will begin with a brief review of the student demographic section that we updated in the fall. And then Steph will walk us through the poverty metrics that IBO uses in both the attendance and the achievement sections of indicators. And following those two sections, we'll uh, pause for some Q&A. Next, Taina will review the attendance section, and then we'll have Q&A after that as well. And finally, Steph will lead us through the achievement section, which covers performance on the standardized test, as I mentioned, uh, for um, the grades three to eight, as well as regions exams for high school students. We report separately on traditional public and charter schools. Um, and then finally, we'll wrap up with uh, additional Q&A and, and handle any questions that we were unable to address during the webinar. So with that, I will hand it over to Taina to review our student demographics section. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, so um, we've updated indicators uh, this year, opting in some sections for simpler charts and in other sections we've provided greater context an example of that is putting in a poverty variables that Steph is going to um, explain later in the webinar but i'm going to start by just um, a brief review of what we've already um, published in december i'm going to share my screen real quick to get to our education indicators from our home page it's here on the left and i'll start with a snapshot um, our first page, and this is just an overall view of the New York City school system, the number of traditional public school students, the number of charter school students, uh, the number of traditional public school programs, and the number of charter schools. And we also have the numbers of District 75 and District 79 students. These are both administrative districts. Uh, District 75 is for student is. Um, self-contained special education programs. And these are sometimes housed in standalone buildings or alongside traditional public schools. 
and District 79 uh, students, or District 79 encompasses a variety of different programs um, from uh, technical training centers, high school equivalency programs, adult education, um, and um, education centers for students with behavioral and substance abuse issues. Then we just take a look at the um, education system as a whole and the share of students in charter, private, and traditional public schools. And then we zero in a little bit more on the traditional public school system, looking at the share of students in community-based organizations and traditional public schools. This is 3K. Then we have pre-K, uh, the share of students in traditional public schools, CBOs, and um, charters, the small amount of charter schools providing pre-K. And then we look at elementary school um, students, the share in traditional public school and charter, and we do that for middle school grades and high school grades. And then we just um, finish this page with a look at the number of charter schools in uh, each school district and the share of students uh, enrolled in charter schools. The next two sections are gonna mirror each other, except where we don't have um, the data. Um, and the first page is uh, for student demographics and enrollment in traditional public schools. And the second page will look the same, but be for charter schools. And so we look at the right, uh, race and ethnic breakdown of students in traditional public schools. We look at enrollment over time. Uh, and here you'll see the decrease that's been a topic of discussion lately. Um, we do uh, provide the numbers of students by borough. And we look at the change in traditional public school enrollment by borough year over year. We previously reported this in five-year increments. And then we look at the share of traditional public schools for English language learners, the languages they speak, the share of traditional public schools uh, students, um, the share of um, students with disabilities in the traditional public school system. And then we look at um, the share of students with disabilities enrolled in District 75 programs. Those are those standalone special education programs. And we report on that citywide and also across the various grade levels. Um, so, and then we look at the, the classifications of students uh, with disabilities and the housing status of students in traditional public schools. Uh, something I forgot to mention that I wanna point out that with this new version of a student indicators, we're not providing PDF tables anymore. We actually have a download data um, button next to the charts where you can download the data feeding those charts directly as a CSV. So you'll see them for most charts, um, bottom left. So I'll go to the next session with, section, which I, again, will mirror the section we just saw previously, but now we're reporting on charter school students. So we have their race and ethnic, background, uh, ethnic breakdown, their enrollment numbers, number of students by borough, change in their enrollment by borough. Again, this is from year to year. So from, in this case, from 2019, 2020 to 2020, Share of students for English language learners, their languages spoken, and the share of students with disabilities and their classifications. And um, next, uh, Steph is going to discuss um, the poverty variables that you'll see in the attendance and achievement section. Thanks, Tina. Um, okay, so IBO created a poverty measure using income data on students' census tracts, which we take from the American Community Survey, and that's produced annually by the U.S. Census Bureau. So our measure is based on the one developed by the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity, and that measure takes into account the local cost of living in New York City. And as we all know, the local cost of living is much higher here than the national cost of living that's reflected by the federal poverty line. So the local poverty measure for New York City is higher than the federal measure, and it captures more people living in poverty. So we'll go ahead and just drop a link in the chat to our report 
on the local poverty measure that you can look at. And um, we have two poverty levels that we'll be examining in the indicators report. So we have student poverty, and then we also have schools shares of students who come from a low income neighborhood. So just starting with student poverty, we begin with students who come from a low income neighborhood defined as $35,000 from 2019 data, which is the most recent data that we have available. Um, and that $35,000 is based on the local threshold that I just mentioned. So when we refer to neighborhood, it's always the student census tract of residents uh, throughout the report. So just keep that in mind. Um, so we look at whether students come from a neighborhood where the median household income is less than or equal to $35,000. So that's just a binary. And there are multiple graphs that just show a binary, whether the student comes from a neighborhood that's less than or equal to $35,000 or not. Um, so then we also look at student neighborhood poverty on a spectrum. So what is the degree to which a student's neighborhood income falls relative to the $35,000 poverty measure. Is the neighborhood income a bit higher than $35,000? Is it a lot higher than $35,000? And we call this the student poverty level. So it's the level at which a student's neighborhood median income falls compared with $35,000. So I'm just gonna show you my screen so we can look at those levels. So in the table, you can see how we categorize students' neighborhood poverty level as low, medium, or high. So the poverty level is low if it's greater than or equal to 1.85 times the measure or about $65,000. It's medium if it's greater than or equal to 1.3 times the measure or roughly $46,000. And it's high if it's less than 1.3 times the measure. So these cutoffs of 1.3 and 1.85 were created by the federal government for determining eligibility for various public assistance programs. And so we just adapted those. So also notice these cutoffs are coded in reverse. So the lower the poverty level, the farther the income is from the poverty measure. So in other words, the higher the neighborhood income rises above 35,000, the lower the poverty level. So we also look at school poverty. So for school poverty, we're going back to the binary measure of low income and not low income. So remember a low income neighborhood has a median income of $35,000 or less. So at the school level, we're looking at simply the shares of students in each school who come from a low income neighborhood. And we split schools into three equal groups based on their share. So I'll just go and show you that table. So um, one thing to note is that we have different cutoffs for traditional public schools in districts one through 32. And that's on the left. And then also notice on the right, there are uh, cutoffs for charter schools as well. So just starting on the left, we're looking at for traditional public schools, their shares of students from low income neighborhoods. And we consider them small if their share falls in the bottom third or less of all schools medium if their share is less is greater than or equal to the bottom third and less than two thirds of all schools and large if their share is greater than or equal to two thirds of all schools. So for example, if we just look at traditional public schools again on the left, the bottom third of schools have 3% or less of their students coming from a low income neighborhood. Um, and the cutoffs for traditional public schools and charter schools differ a bit. They also differ between grade levels, and that's due to the differences in concentrations of low-income students in those schools. So I'll just pause for questions before I hand it back to Tyna. 
Thanks, Steph. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions on um, the student demographics section to begin with. Um, so the first question is, are homeschool students tracked? Uh, we include them in our overall enrollment numbers for the whole system, but not tracked otherwise um, by us in, in these indicators. Right, when we look at um, school level, um, we do not include homeschool students in those. Um, the next question is about um, charter enrollment. Um, I'd be curious to know more about how you assign charter enrollment to district, given that some charter schools have locations in multiple districts, for example. We do this by at the school level, not at the um, at the level of um, the charter system, like the what are those called? Um, the network, right. The network. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So um, we do it based on the location of the charter school, like what district uh, it's located in. Um, another question we have is how does school poverty, how does the school poverty measure compare with Title I eligibility cutoff, which in most boroughs is 60 percent of the student of the school students are deemed poor based on family income? So, Steph, can you talk a little bit about how uh, the neighborhood income measure differs from the family income measure? Sure, so um, at the neighborhood level, um, so again, we're, we're considering a low income neighborhood, a uh, neighborhood that's has a median income of $35,000 or less. And when you look at the um, lunch eligibility measure, or sorry, Title I eligibility. Yeah, so the, the cutoffs are different. And I actually, unfortunately, didn't um, like memorize the, the different uh, dollar figures. So um, so I can't answer that now, but we, we're happy to follow up with you about that. Right, and um, you know, the, the, those um, cutoffs are based on the, the national poverty threshold, which is different than the local one that we are using. Um, and then we have another question. How do you track or get the number of students, the numbers for kids with special education or disabilities? Um, so we do have an indicator on our, um, our, uh, at the student level that identifies students with an IEP. And that is what we use um, to track uh, students with disabilities. Uh, we also know by school, whether those students attend um, a District 75 program that Tina mentioned, or whether they attend a Districts 1 through 32 school. Um, those are all the questions we have right now. So I will turn it back over to uh, Tina to review the attendance section. Okay, uh, there's been, uh, we've uh, heavily expanded the attendance uh, section from what we had previously. We've chosen to focus on it as a standalone metric. Uh, previously, we'd only reported it under our student achievement section, and you'll still see charts addressing achievement results based on attendance. But we also wanted to look at attendance in more detail and decoupled from achievement, as it can be correlated with circumstances that are beyond a student's control, for example, their housing, health, or economic situation. Um, So the attendance rate that we report on here is the total days present in school divided by the total amount of days a student is registered. Uh, and then we average it by each st uh, student demographic. As you'll see here, we're also reporting on attendance rate based on a variety of different demographic backgrounds. And the other thing that we wanted to do um, was to dissect this attendance rate a little bit further is add a section on chronic absenteeism, which you'll see at the bottom of, of this page here. And chronic absenteeism is the share of students who are absent over 10% of the time, or to put it another way, they are present less than 90% of the time. Um, this looks at the rate at which some students are absent more often. Uh, so, and so, for example, in a normal school year with 180 days, a student registered for that full time would need to be absent over 18 days to be considered chronically absent. Um, and 
as Sarita mentioned at the start of the webinar, this is using 2019-2020 data. So for attendance, we're looking at attendance before um, March 13th, which is when schools were shut down for the COVID-19 pandemic. So for chronic absenteeism, missing 10% or more of that school year of 2019-2020 means being absent for at least 12 days if you were present uh, for that full year. The other thing I'd like to note on these charts um, as we go through them is just that um, sort of to look at the top in the detail more, we have um, these the, these x-axis at from 50% to 100%, but then that flips um, to look at the chronic absentee rate. So here we, we're seeing it from zero to 50%. So I just wanted to point that out. Again, you have the download data function um, to download all this data as a CSV file, if you'd like. Um, so I'm just gonna um, look, uh, review some of our findings um, here. I just want you to keep in mind that this is all students attending in one school year. So each population is a unique group of students. We're not tracking any one demographic uh, over time. So just looking at elementary school grades, uh, we do see that students uh, in temporary housing have um, the lowest attendance rate compared to the various other demographic groups that we report on. Um, and you'll see this correlates with a higher chronic absentee rate for the same grade level. Here they have a chronic absentee rate of 35.8%. And you'll also see that students um, who live in low-income neighborhoods also have a lower attendance rate, 91.5%. Again, students um, who live in low-income neighborhoods live in census tracts where the median income is lower than $35,000 a year, which is um, what Steph discussed earlier. In middle school grades overall, attendance rates are slightly higher, but then looking at high school where overall attendance rates are lower, we see that students in temporary housing have um, the lowest rate in high school as well with 83.7% and also a fairly high chronic absenteeism rate uh, at 43.2%. So this means that 43.2% of students in temporary housing were missing more than 10% of the school year prior to March 13th. They're in high school, they're not the only um, demographics that have lower attendance rates. Here, low-income neighborhood students also have low attendance rates in, as well as English language learners and students with disabilities. And then you'll see this is correlated with higher chronic absentee rates. Meaning that there's out of the, that lower attendance rate is has a fair amount of students that are absent more often. Um, I would like to bring attention to a previous report um, that a fellow um, analyst called Liza Pappas did in October 2016. Um, she conducted a qualitative and quantitative study that looked into the impact of a student's housing situation on their attendance rates. The study was conducted over the 2014-2015 school year and highlighted issues that led to lower attendance rates pertinent to that year. Uh, even with increased attention to the matter by relevant agencies, so DOE, ACS, and DHS, um, this data shows that students in temporary housing continue to have lower attendance rates as compared to other demographics. Um, I'll stop for questions and then Steph is going to review the achievement section. Thanks, Tina. Uh, so um, our first question on um, attendance is there's been some reporting recently about the um, overall um, high rates of chronic absenteeism um, this year. Um, is that something that you um, are able to comment on based on the data that you've seen from the past? Um, uh, we don't have the data to comment on it for this year. Um, the chronic absentee rate overall in previous years as you mentioned, it's, other than in high school, it was around 20%, a little bit lower for elementary, and then a little bit higher at 27% for high school grades. And again, but again, that's uh, pre-pandemic. Um, and then we have another question um, 
is attendance measured by uh, the full day out of school? It is measured uh, by the full day out of school, but that um, that's different from being late. Um, that's classified differently. Right. And then finally, um, you talked about um, students in temporary housing and students from low income neighborhoods having, you know, particularly lower um, attendance rates um, in high school. Do you have a sense of the overlap uh, in those two groups? Um, there is some overlap, uh, but not a, not a ton. It's so 35% of students in temporary housing live in low income neighborhoods. So the inverse is that 65% of students um, living in um, temporary housing are not living in uh, low income neighborhoods. So there's a different population of people. Great. And then one final question is absentee is, is the absenteeism measure for remote learning as well. Uh, and this is something that we are requesting for uh, more recent data. Do keep in mind that the data that um, is currently in indicators is pre-pandemic, so um, before the shutdown. Um, but there, we are in the process of requesting data on remote learning for last year as well, and we do plan to ask for it. Um, uh, separately for students who are fully remote, um, as opposed to students who were in a hybrid setting. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Steph now uh, to review our achievement section. Thanks, Sarita. Okay, so um, so we're going to start with traditional public schools for students in grades three through eight. We're going to look at their test performance in 2018-2019 school year. Uh, so all students in grades three through eight take the annual New York State exam in English language arts and in math, though students can opt out. Uh, and the students are assigned to one of four groups based on their scaled scores. So if they score at a level one or a level two, that's considered less than proficient. And if they score at a level three or a level four, that's considered proficient. Um, and so throughout this page, we're just going to look at the proficiency rates of students. And we'll also look uh, just at the beginning at the share of students at each performance level. So on the left here, you can see we have the share of students at level one through four in ELA and in math on the right. And then we also look at the performance by student neighborhood poverty level, which we went over in a little bit of depth earlier. So students who score at a level one are red, level two yellow, three blue and four green. And you can see that as I hover over, you can choose to highlight um, each level and the other levels will fade, um, which is helpful to, to take a closer look at this. Um, so we can see that students who come from high poverty neighborhoods tend to score at lower levels relative to students who come from low poverty neighborhoods. You can see that these are trends here. Um, we're not looking at anything um, from a causal perspective throughout indicators, so just keep that in mind. And so in these graphs, we're adding in another layer. So we're looking at the ELA and the math proficiency rates by both the student neighborhood poverty level and also the share of students who come from a low-income neighborhood in schools at the school level. So just looking here on the left, we're looking at school shares of students from low-income neighborhoods. These are schools with large shares of students from low-income neighborhoods, medium shares, and then small shares. So just an example to interpret this graph, if we look here, we're looking at among students who attend a school with a large share of students from low-income neighborhoods, specifically for students who come from a neighborhood with high poverty, about 30% of them are proficient in ELA. 
And then if we look at students who come from a neighborhood with median poverty, roughly 38% of them score proficient in ELA. And then finally, students who come from a neighborhood with low poverty, up to approximately 42% of students score proficient. So as the uh, student's neighborhood poverty level lowers, the share of students proficient increases, which is generally intuitive to people who look at education research. Um, but what's interesting is if we go down here and we look at students who attend a school with a small share of students from a low income neighborhood, for those students who come from a neighborhood with high poverty, up to 47% 47 of students score proficient, which is higher than the students who attend a school with a large share of students from a low income neighborhood, but are coming from a neighborhood themselves that's low poverty. So we can see that there's this positive relationship or there's this effect of attending a school with low poverty and how that relates to students' academic outcomes. So, um, so now we're going back to just the binary um, measure of neighborhood income. So we're just looking at whether a student comes from an, a neighborhood that's low income or that's not low income. So on the left here, we're looking at the ELA proficiency rates by both the race and ethnicity of the student and also the student's neighborhood income. And so here on the left, we have students who don't come from a neighborhood that's considered low income. And here we have students who come from a low income neighborhood. And we have the same thing for math. And here we have the proficiency rates by the English language learner status of the student and also their neighborhood income level. So on the left, we have students who are proficient in English. And then here on the right in the purple, we have students who are English language learners. So you can highlight them. And we also have the proficiency rates by the special education status of the student and also their neighborhood income level. So here on the left, we have students who are in general education. And then here in the burgundy, we have students who are in special education. And we also have the proficiency rates by the students in temporary housing status. So here on the left, these are students who are permanently housed, so they're not in temporary housing. And then these three bars represent students in various forms of temporary housing. So these are students who are doubled up, meaning they're living with family or friends, like Tina had mentioned earlier, or they're living in a shelter, or they're living in another form of temporary housing, such as a hotel or a motel, or they're awaiting foster care. And then finally, for this section, we have the proficiency rates for ELA and math by the student's attendance rate. So here we have good attendance, and that's students who are attending school 90% of the time or more. And then we have students who are chronically absent. Uh, recall that's students who attend school between 80 to 90% of the time and then severely chronically absent, those are students who are attending school less than 80% of the time. So in this next section, we're gonna turn over to charter schools and we're gonna again, look at the grades three through eight test performance only for students who attend a charter school in New York City. So this should be familiar. We have the share of students at each performance level here, one through four. And don't feel like you have to memorize the numbers. You can view this on your own time. And so again, we also have the performance for ELA and math by the neighborhood poverty level of the student. Um, and you can probably see that uh, there's a smaller share of students who are coming from a high poverty neighborhood that are scoring at a level one compared to what you saw um, when we were looking at the students who attend traditional public schools. 
And we also have, again, the proficiency rates by both the student neighborhood poverty level and also the school share of students who come from a low income neighborhood. And the trends here are similar. Um, you can see that as the um, the poverty level of the student's neighborhood lowers, the share of students proficient increases, but there's smaller differences between them. Um, and we, we can also see that the, that the um, difference for students who attend a school with a small share of students from, uh, from a low income neighborhood, but come from a high poverty neighborhood, that difference between them and students who come from a low poverty neighborhood and attend a school with a large share of low income students is smaller compared to what we saw with students who attend a traditional public school. And we also see those differences flesh out here, of course, when we look at proficiency rates by just the student neighborhood income level. Um, and then we're also partitioning this here by race and ethnicity, as you saw earlier. We have the same for math. So slightly smaller differences here between students' proficiency rates who come from a low-income neighborhood and those who don't compared to traditional public schools. And then again, we have the proficiency rates by the English language learner status of the student and their neighborhood income level for both ELA and math, um, as well as for students who are in special education versus general education and their, and their neighborhood income level. Um, and we do, we do not get the same attendance data for charter schools, so we're not able to report on that um, for this section. Um, and I'm just gonna show you one more section, but I'm, I'm gonna let you know, we do have the um, proficiency rates for um, charter network affiliation for both ELA and math, and you're fr free to peruse that in your own time. Um, so I'm just gonna show you finally the tr uh, traditional public school student achievement for high school regions performance. And we also have this for charter schools as well. Um, and so you can go and view that on the website. But in the interest of time, this can get, we don't want this to get repetitive. So we're just gonna show you the traditional public school regions performance. Um, so here uh, again, you can see the, um, sorry, let me uh, no, note that students, all students take regents in order to graduate from high school. Um, and specifically here, we're just looking at students in grades nine through 12. So there are some eighth graders that do take a regents exam, but many do not. And so we're not capturing those eighth graders. We're strictly looking at students in, in high school in, in grades nine through 12 here. And, um, and we're gonna be looking at the pass rates for regents, uh, for English and for math. And a passing score for regents exam is 65 or higher. Um, and the other thing to note is that there's one single English regents exam, but there's various math regents exams. Uh, the math exam we're capturing here is the best score of the student. So whichever test they take, we take the best score and we treat that as their math regents exam here. So, uh, so here again, we have English regents and math regents pass rates uh, by the student's neighborhood poverty level. So, Similar trends as the poverty level decreases, the share of students passing the English Regents exam and the Math Regents exam is increasing. And again, we also have these pass rates by both the student neighborhood poverty level and also school shares of students from a low income neighborhood. And, um, and if you take a closer look at these, you'll see that there's, um, more students are passing their regents exam, regardless of the, um, the neighborhood poverty level that they're coming from. There, there's the same trends and there's differences um, between students who attend a school with a large share of low-income students versus a small share, but there's, there's a, a, a muted effect we could see compared to when, what we saw with students' proficiency rates for the grades three through eight test scores. Um, especially in the English and in the math, um, actually you, you are seeing something similar to what you saw with the grades three through eight test scores. And, um, and here we have the English regions pass rates by 
the race and ethnicity of the student and also their neighborhood income level. Um, pretty significantly high pass rates here for English. Um, lower for math. And again, we have the pass rates by the English language learner status of the student and their neighborhood income level. So we have English proficient again, and then these are English language learners. Um, we also have the pass rates by the special education status of the student and their neighborhood income level. And then we have the pass rates by um, the students uh, student temporary housing status. So again, these are students who are permanently housed. And then these are students who are in temporary housing, these three bars. And finally, we have the pass rates for English and math by the student's attendance rate. So we have good attendance, chronically absent, and severely chronically absent. And so we're gonna, um, we have other sections, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you are free to look at um, these outcomes by charter network. We have them for both grades three through eight and for grades nine through 12, the, um, the pass rates for regents. Um, and we also have the regents exam outcomes broken down um, this same way um, for charter high schools. So you can see that as well. Thank you, Steph. Uh, that was a very um, great explanation of our achievement sections. We do have a couple of questions. Um, so the first is, um, do you have any theories on why the concentration of poverty is most impactful on elementary students, particularly for non-charters? So we, we can't answer that um, with with the indicators reports, we didn't look into that specifically or do a study on it. But what I can say, I can speculate a little bit and say that there are studies that, um, that do show that the impact of neighborhood poverty can be stronger on younger people. Um, and that impact can fade a bit as the student um, grows up and gets, gets older. But, um, but we couldn't say definitively just based on this report. And um, it's important to keep in mind that we, while we are making comparisons between traditional public schools and for charter schools, charter schools do operate differently. Each network operates differently. Schools have their own curricula. So, um, and that's different than what the Department of Education does. And, and so they're not necessarily a perfect comparison group. Thank you. And then uh, one other question on, um, opting out. So I know students can opt out of state tests um, pre-pandemic, uh, I'm sorry, post-pandemic. Uh, was that also the case pre-pandemic? Yes, students were able to opt out prior to the pandemic as well. Great. Um, and then we have a couple of other questions um, um, not specifically related to our sections, but more general. Um, do you also measure for high quality or broadband internet connectivity and use that as a metric for other analyses? Um, that is a great question. Uh, we don't currently have that data. Um, we are trying to get more data and information on the distribution of devices to students. Um, and potentially um, some of the survey um, responses to some of the surveys that were administered um, during the pandemic, uh, but we do not have that data yet. And another question we have is this data is fantastically helpful in crafting policy, but since IBO's jurisdiction extends to reviewing city education policies, what critiques of current or proposed DOE practices can IBO offer? Uh, so I will note that um, our education indicators are designed to be more as a reference document. Um, and so it is um, basically providing some descriptive statistics of uh, the school system, as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we do have some other papers, uh, like longer term research papers that delve more deeply into these kind of topics and particular DOE policies. Um, you know, a couple that I shared um, in the chat. Um, so you can take a look at that to see some of our more robust um, research papers 
that have looked into particular um, DOE policies. Um, another question, do you have the stats on the opt-out students and is it more in the poverty areas? Uh, we do um, not have opt-out data actually at the student level. We simply know whether or not the student took the standardized exam, um, but it, we don't know if it was be due to an absence or opting out at the student level. Uh, another question, am I correct in noticing that the ELL demographic data is older than the other demographic data? Did something happen with ELL data? Uh, so this is actually related to the fact that um, we tried to provide the student demographic data um, at, at the, mo at the um, most uh, recent available that we have to us. So sometimes uh, we do have that available at, um, on the audited register. And so that might be um, a more recent data. So like, for example, our enrollment data is a little bit more recent than um, some of our demographic data, which, is, which comes from a different file, which we get um, a bit lagged. And so that was sort of what I ref was referring to in terms of having different years of data in different sections. Um, I think those are all the questions we have right now. Um, yeah, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us um, for this uh, webinar today. Um, as I mentioned, it is being recorded and the recording will be made available on our website. Uh, if you subscribe to our um, email list, you will get a notification of when it is available. Um, thank you so much and feel free to reach out to us directly with um, any questions that might come in the future. Have a good day. Thanks everyone.